Well, I've had this diesel behind me now for almost 10 plus years and the project is almost finished. I've really just got a few minor upgrades to do on it. The four litre out there, it's a bit of a new project and I'm kind of just starting on that with corrosion and getting the body of that vehicle into like a viable project to put money into because obviously you don't want to be just chucking money at a rust bucket. If you've just bought a vehicle, like you've just bought a Cherokee, um, one of the biggest mistakes I made early on was I didn't really know which direction I was going in when I bought the vehicle. I was working as a bushcraft instructor at the time, I needed an SUV, I bought the Cherokee, I put like a really crappy rough country uh, four and a half inch lift on it, I mean that lift basically came with it anyway actually but I just had to kind of retrofit some stuff and buy some things that I thought were missing but it had some remolded 31 inch mud tyres and, and really it was, it was a rough ride, you know, excuse the pun it was like really bad me and a friend of mine Dan we used to just sort of rail around some of the off-road trails and the green lanes and, and some of the pay and play sites and use the thing and have some fun and so you know it was a really cool thing to play around in but I had no idea I would turn it into this thing and I would pull every part rebuild absolutely everything so having a direction anyway in, in where you want to take the vehicle early on will help like because if you want to make it into like a long distance kind of overlandy style vehicle you probably probably aren't going to be looking at a lot of the very very heavy off-road aftermarket accessories because a lot of those off-road after aftermarket accessories they're not marketed really with traveling in mind because they're really heavy and you kind of want to be keeping the weight down but having an idea is just really the beginning the, the, the first thing is what you really want to be doing with the Cherokee is inspecting it thoroughly and the, one of the first jobs that I would do is pull that carpet out you've got to get the carpet out. You've got to have a look at what's going on under there. The Cherokee carpet's terrible. I mean, I ripped the carpet out my four liter and, and on the whole, underneath that four liter, it looks fantastic. But you take the carpet out and there was some serious corrosion in the back, not from the underneath of the vehicle, but where water is trapped underneath the carpet. You might think, oh, but my door seals are good. Like the weather strip looks great. There's no way water's getting in the vehicle. I'm telling you now, there is always a way for water to get into the vehicle and uh, you never know what history that vehicle's had. You know, even just getting in a vehicle with snow on your boots for the whole winter will put inches of water underneath that carpet because it will all soak through and it will find its way through the foam and it will get trapped underneath. And you just got to get that carpet out and you've just got to figure out what you're dealing with. What I will advise as well is, is a great thing to get into when you've just bought a vehicle like this is welding. And my welder there sitting there is, is a piece of crap. Cost me about 250 euros, really cheap. I've done loads of projects with it. They're not so great for finer work like sheet metal and stuff where you've got a spot weld, but on the thick stuff, you can just crank those things up to death and weld eight mil. I mean, that's a 160. So, you know, getting yourself a welder alongside a vehicle like this is actually quite a sound investment because more often than not, when you buy a Cherokee in this day and age, unless you live in a mild climate, you're probably gonna have to do some welding. So let's say then you've dealt with all of that. You know, you've got the carpet out and everything else. Do you want to put the carpet back in? I would strongly advise you don't. One thing I've done on this is, is used silent coat panels, foam in some areas and other types of sand in insulation. But down on the footwell, you can see it's, it's pretty much just, you know, these plates that are bonded to the Raptor liner. And it's a really good practice to fix those silent coat panels down with a heat gun. So you know that like the bitumen or whatever's underneath the aluminium sheet that you're sort of bonding down is actually melting and actually bonding to the paint. And that way you minimize moisture getting underneath those panels. Now, sure, you can put a mat down like I've done. You can even put pieces of foam down and other such things on, on the footwell, make it removable. So being able to pull all the mats out and just let it air out has saved the vehicle's ass, to be honest with you. So it's the best advice I can give on that side of things, really. There's one tool you're going to become very familiar with if you own a vehicle like this and you want to work on it, and that's a grinder and wire wheels. There's a lot of other tools too you can use and there are great products out these days. One product I would absolutely shy away from is rust converter. The tannic acid stuff, the white stuff that you spray on rust, it goes black, it's supposed to convert it, you can paint over it. Those products are shit, don't use them. Just use a wire wheel, get rid of as much rust as you can and then much like I did on the four litre, use a rust removal spray that actually removes the rust out of the pitting. And then once you've done that, 
you can use a high corrosion primer or like a two-part epoxy primer over the top of that and you know it's going to be good for many 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 years probably probably your lifetime you know so you wouldn't need to worry about it again and if it's somewhere inside like on a floor pan you can then bed line over the top of it afterwards and you're done but if you have a look under mine I, i've recently just replenished the undercoat on this cherokee and i tend to do it pretty thoroughly every five years when i first bought the cherokee the first three years of its life was me underneath it with grinders wire wheels shot blasting everything i could to clean up the underside of that vehicle and just get it in as good a position as i could be that i was happy with it um, also things like frame stiffeners and box rockers and stuff too but we'll cover that in a minute because that might come a bit later if you've just bought a Cherokee. You might not be thinking of that first, but in all honesty, if you have got a Cherokee and uh, you're gonna rock crawl it, you're gonna overland it, you're, you're gonna off-road it, you're gonna build it up into something like this, I'd say that's kind of one of the first things you, you should do. But you know, maybe you're just keeping it stock, maybe you just want a, a decent classic looking vehicle and you don't wanna like weld any shit to it, but you still wanna be underneath it and you still wanna be checking it really thoroughly. Um, you really do. Now there are two products I use. One of them is called Dinatrol 3125. Unfortunately, I, I can't find links in the US for this. I know I have a US audience, so, you know, half of them are, so sorry guys, but I think you've got Eastwood and you've probably got loads of other equivalent products out there, ones that are probably better than that, you know, if not the same. So you really just want like a, a creeping film wax that has rust inhibitors in it and it's really thin. So when you're spraying it inside cavities and box sections and things, um, you're basically ensuring that it's like dripping out of all the, the holes in the frame and everything, you know, and you've got like a complete coverage and it's going between all the seams and spot welds. And that's really the first port of call you wanna be using when doing rust treatment on the vehicle. And that will generally displace moisture and it'll also soak into like um, any kind of rust that might be a little bit more than what you'd like. And, and you know usually give you a bit of a fighting chance there but really it's all in the prep work you want to be getting rid of as much of it as physically possible and if it's too far gone cut it out and put new metal in don't even question it then over the top of that i put a really heavy coating called car plan tetra seal which again is another petroleum based product like none of these are rubberized and that's really something i've got to stress like you should not be putting rubberized um undercoats underneath your vehicle because the problem with rubberized is they tend it tends to hold itself to itself well so if water gets behind it or it breaks it won't self-heal it will begin to sag and it and the moisture will hang underneath the sagging and that will cause corrosion problems with the petroleum based products like these products here they tend not to sag um, and they usually have a medium inside them like that tetra seal under seal does um, where it's got like almost like metal particulates in it that keep it together. So when you break it, it just, you end up with a hole, but it doesn't sag and it, and it just self heals very slowly over time. Um, and, it, and it's a really, really good product. I mean, I've used it, like I said, over the last 10 years. And even when I've done big jobs, like I removed loads of under seal to revisit things like adding additional frame stiffness to the rear and stuff like that. And I've not found returning problems in terms of corrosion. So I know that those products are working. If you're living in the desert, just ignore everything I'm saying, all right? And you can just shake your head and be glad that you don't have to deal with any of this crap. So. Uh, you know, I do appreciate there are other environments out there. I've, I've been to them myself. You know, there are some dry as popcorn farts places around and undercoating a vehicle is the last thing you want to be doing because you're just going to be like grit. It's just going to be stuck to the bottom of the vehicle. So, you know, obviously I get that too. But that actually brings me to another point, frame stiffness. If you're gonna be going through the motions of like wire wheeling off your the underneath your vehicle or blasting it or taking a scraper and a blowtorch and getting all the undercoat off, like isn't that a great time to be putting frame stiffeners on? Absolutely, you I mean, you wouldn't wanna be spraying all of that gunk underneath the vehicle or spending tons of money POR 15 it if that's the way you wanna go or painting it only to have to remove all of that work again to put, put frame stiffeners on. Now, if you look at the four liter out there, it's in a prime state to be frame stiffened you know i've got the box rockers out the floor pans are out it's been cleaned up it's ready for welding i just have to clean the frame down and i could start welding some frame stiffeners onto it and then it'd be a perfect time to tie those frame stiffeners into the box rockers sure you're still gonna have a bit of frame flex but you're kind of eliminating a lot of the problems with that mono frame chassis build kind of straight out of the box but 
The thing about a frame stiffener is it's not going to like eliminate all frame flex out of the frame of the vehicle. Um, and more often than not, if you don't do it properly, you're going to transfer weaknesses around the vehicle. So what I've got on this diesel here, I've actually got an L-shaped frame stiffener on the rear part of the frame rail that goes from the back of the bumper all the way down. And then there's a fish plate and that joins up to the center frame stiffener all the way along the middle bit and another fish plate and then the front frame stiffener on the outer edge and on the inner of the front of the frame I've got another half plate that goes down and those two things there are for the steering box I've got another one the other side because you know you've got to make it uniform obviously or else one side's weaker than the other and then at the back you've got a tie-in bracket that's built in as part of the bumper so you're slotting the bumper internally into the frame and then that's all bolting into the frame stiffener so doing that to get like all of that together I would say is a really good way of stiffening up the frame of the vehicle without requiring like an exo cage or an internal roll cage which is clearly gonna really stiffen the vehicle up because then you're tying all the sides in together with tubes and triangulation and stuff obviously not everybody wants to do that it just depends what you're going to do with the vehicle obviously and i guess the best thing about a frame stiffener and probably the main reason for having one isn't just for like stiffening up the frame of the cherokee is to be able to weld on it so if you look at the three link cross member on mine welded straight onto the frame stiffener and I'm not like welding it to like two and a half mil sheet metal or three mil or whatever the Cherokee frame is originally but anyway I've droned on about like the preparations of the vehicle for ages you, you get the point but that's all the stuff I would do again right off the bat but if you are in a fortunate position where you've bought a Cherokee just as a project vehicle and you've got other vehicles to use or you don't need to drive something like that and you can set it aside you, you can go through the beginning stages of it methodically and, and come out the other end of it with with a pretty solid platform that you can then start doing the fun stuff with i guess the other thing is is just general maintenance stuff like don't skimp out on general maintenance stuff so you know you want to be checking brake lines changing brake discs checking ball joints having a look at the, the steering knuckles um the ball joints on the steering knuckles tie rod ends all that kind of stuff most of the time when you buy a cherokee it's all garbage it's all like totally wallowed out they've got play in them if you're getting into the point where you're going to be buying suspension you might want to be holding off on just swapping out individual individual bushings on control arms like uppers and lowers and stuff like that because you know usually suspension comes with a leaf pack coils sway bar links a pan hard rod uh, bracketry if it's a good suspension kit um, control arms upper and lower adjustable maybe a long arm kit if you're going to go down that route personally I would say if you're going four and a half inches or above just go long arm straight away and don't bother with anything else there's some good affordable long arm kits out there that aren't that much more than a short arm kit and you know you're, you're killing two birds with one stone you're, you're kind of future proofing it like I went short arms first and then drop brackets which made it a whole lot better and I ran drop brackets for nine years up until last year when I built this three link. And now I've built the three link, I was like, geez, I should have just done this ages ago, but I just didn't know any better. Yeah, I, I would say if you're getting into suspension, you don't need to bother with like the, the bushings on leaf springs and everything, because if you buy the right suspension kit, you're going to get all that stuff anyway. And so just leave it as it is until you get that and then just swap it all out when you do it. There's no point doing that job twice. Um, but on, on the, the front of steering, I would say steering is usually a, a something that's neglected for, for a while anyway. I've seen some fairly built rigs out there running stock steering. You know, I guess if you're just like doing it for looks, fine but all it takes is for you to like nudge that tire into a curb or something or, or, or an embankment and it could basically bend that tie rod i've done it on my previous setup so it's, it's a really it's a really easy thing to do um so i would say like if you're looking at suspension um you, you probably want to be factoring in some steering with it too but this is the thing it's about the budget isn't it it goes without saying suspension is probably one of the first thing most people are going to do because they want the vehicle to lift up look good put big tires on you know and then they're going to take a walk away from the vehicle turn around stand at it get a semi and then be like now i need a winch bumper and, that, and that's usually the way it goes suspension bump like tires bumpers and then all the other stuff that that is probably more important than that 
um, will, will come will come last. And uh, you know, there is one thing that, that has to be said: when you lift the vehicle up and you put big tyres on it, it's much easier to work on. I mean, I did all the undercoat on this, crawling around underneath it. You know, if you want your vehicle to be easier to work on, sure, lift it up and get, but just get a get a good suspension set up. I think just don't skimp on suspension because it will come back to bite you. So back in the day, I used to think my Jeep was a submarine and uh, I used to like go through water and I used to take it through rivers and, and be a total idiot with it. And one thing I really neglected was, was the breathers, like for the transmission and the axles and the transfer case, like you have a vent. And the thing is, is when you've been driving along real fast, let's say you've been on the motorway or the highway and you're doing like 80 miles an hour, uh, which is pretty quick in these things, like the diff gets hot, the transmission gets hot, the transfer case is hot. Let's say if you then went off road on a trail to meet your friends and there was a river and they were like, drive through that river, yeah, all right. And you went straight in like I used to do. You suddenly plunge the diff and the transfer case and everything into cold water. And, and it basically sucks in all the water and then you contaminate all your oil. I did that with my Liberty, the one I did before this, and, and I, I didn't do it on this one because I learned from the mistakes I did on the Liberty. So one thing I would, I would definitely do, elevate your breathers somewhere up in the engine bay. You don't need a snorkel. I mean, I've got one for dust, but my breathers go up to about the, the hood cowl and you've got yourself a, a decent little project to get on with really that will, will be beneficial for you. Like the next thing I'll get into is bumpers. And to be honest with you, bumpers is, is probably the second thing on most people's list. Um, if you look at my front bumper, it's made out of six mil, eight mil and four mil steel. I've had a head on collision in my Cherokee. Um, I don't think I've ever said that on the channel before, but where I used to live in the UK, I, I was working as a bushcraft instructor at the time. And it was actually just after I installed frame stiffeners and I had this bumper on. I didn't have a, a rear bumper at the time, I just had a stock bumper. Um, <clears throat> and I was driving along, and, I, and, and in the UK we drove on the right, we drive on the right hand side of the road. I don't live in the UK now. Um, I can't imagine driving on the right hand side of the road anymore. Oh, sorry, we drove on the left hand side, what am I talking about? So I was driving on the left hand side of the road and I was driving along, and a kid, in a Vauxhall Nova um, with, a, with a kind of body kit on it, came round the corner, basically on the wrong side of the road, and he, and he head-on collisioned me here on the front of my bumper. Um, and like, I was going pretty slowly uphill, pr probably like 20, 20 kilometers an hour, 20 miles per hour. He was probably doing more like 35, 40, which isn't that quick, but on a blind corner on the wrong side of the road, there's no time to react. So. He impacted the vehicle and, and it just like folded that Vauxhall Nova's front end in half and just wrecked the engine and everything like, and, um, and he was obviously in shock and, you know, and everything else and, and like, but, but the, the, the truck was fine. I just lost some paint on the front end. It does literally all that happened. Um, so, you know, that, that is one thing about having, a, having a, a, a solid bumper at the front, you know, it could potentially save your vehicle from an asshole, from an idiot who's doing something stupid. Now, you do have to drive extra careful because the reality is, is like I'm a dad and I've got kids and, and I can't imagine anything bad happening to them. And the reality is, is like a vehicle like this is kind of more dangerous. And although the bumper doesn't have any sharp edges, which is a law in the UK, uh, sorry, in Europe, like, you, you know, if you have a, a, a metal bumper, it can't have sharp edges on it. So if these recovery points were sticking out the front there, they'd be like, nah, we don't like that because that's like a an impact point. The reality is, is the bumper's basically a death sentence as it is, but you need to drive carefully with it. You know what I mean? You really do. But the main thing being, and one thing I haven't mentioned, is a frame stiffener alongside an aftermarket bumper will save your frame from cracking at the front where the steering box is and the pan hard bar bracket is. That's usually where they crack and, and where they go. So early on, I would say that if you're going to um, get bigger tires and suspension for a Cherokee, see about an aftermarket bumper, think about frame stiffness, and also think about a steering box brace. If you, you know, if you can tie it all together in as many places as possible, it, it, will, it will stand the test of time and it will move those big tires for you. But another side of that is what are you gonna use the vehicle for? Like, are you, are you going to overland it? I mean, overlanding's not really even a thing, is it? Like, unless you 
actually live in a country where you can do overlanding but for me i i, I just call it car camping because you know i don't really overland you know i go to like national parks and um nature reserves and wild places in nature and i fish uh, i used to hunt i don't anymore would maybe i will do again but the whole point is it's just a vehicle to get me out there to get me on location where i can hike and enjoy nature do some fly fishing or whatever and then cook some fish around the campfire and have a comfortable place to sleep at night. That's what this vehicle's for. It doesn't really suit the bill of an overland vehicle because of its lift height and tire size. Um, but that is because I live in a country that's predominantly snow dominated and I need the flotation and the ground clearance. Really, a 35 is the minimum tire I should be running. I should be on like a bigger tire, like a, like a Nokia Hakapalita 38 would be the ideal tire for me but it requires a front end swap, like an axle swap to actually run a tire that size. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of, I'm going off on a tangent as I always do, probably pissing everyone off. But the point is, is wait, think about what you're doing with your vehicle. Do you need like a winch bumper? Because this is, this is 40 kilos. This is 40 kilos. Rear bumpers, 55 kilos. The rear tire and the wheel together on the back there is 46 kilos no sorry 42 actually you know that's a lot of weight isn't it you know to be putting on your vehicle now i get 25 miles per gallon out of this out of this turbo diesel but it's a turbo diesel the four liter gets wouldn't get that if it was weighing in around 2.1 tons like this thing is here so you know the best thing to do is, is really just think about what it is you're doing with your vehicle if you've just bought it and, and like draw pictures, like not dick pics, but maybe like find pictures on Google of vehicles you like the look of and, and think about them. I could probably try and give more advice, but I, I don't know whether I should keep, keep talking. This video has been pretty long and, and you know, it, it was just convenient for me to do this video at this moment in time because we're like expecting a baby. I've not got any trips planned right now. I've got some time off at home with my wife and she's just having a nap at the moment she's a bit tired bless her so obviously you know when you're really pregnant and it's right at the end it's you know i'd know i'd know <laughs> I, i'd you know try and do my best obviously but uh i'm going to end it there i'm going to end it there if you've got any questions feel free to fire below but do you know what M more importantly i know a lot of people out there have way more experience than me in in this field um and, and i'm always learning from, from people in the comments section about these sorts of things. I'm never the kind of guy on this channel to try and present myself as an authority in a subject because it's just not the case. Like I think one of the, the shittest things about YouTube and social media these days is just because people make videos, they start to be seen as people who are like leading the field, but we're not. They're just, they're just people who make a video, who are, who are probably good at talking and who are comfortable in front of a camera. Like, I feel like I'm pretty good at the jobs I do mechanically, but I make shit tons of mistakes. And, and that's all a part of it. And I'm always learning and I'm always showing those mistakes on camera because I think it's valuable for people to see me make mistakes and go, look at that dumbass, I'm not gonna do that. And then you save yourself making that mistake. So if you've got any suggestions is what I'm trying to say, you know, in the comments section for people out there who've just bought Cherokees, write it below because it's all really useful stuff um, or any vehicle really, you know, even if it's like an old, old Forerunner or, you know, an old Nissan Navara or anything, you know, like I know a lot of people are building different rigs up and they're, they're all the same underneath it all. You know what I mean? They're all, it's all the same principle really underneath it all. It's just a different platform. But look, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful. I hope I put enough B-roll in there so you weren't looking at my face all the time. Um, I've got some pretty cool stuff coming up on the channel. Like, as I said, I've just done, this is for the regular viewers anyway, who are interested in upcoming content. I know most people don't really give a shit about it. Like I always say, we've all got lives to live. But if you are interested, I've just done the undercoat procedure on this. Um, so this truck is like mission ready now. But I have got a pretty cool thing in a box over there that I'm going to be putting on in the next video. And I'm very lucky to have been uh, to have been sponsored that. Um, you know, it's not something that happens very often on a little channel like mine, but I obviously, you know, the dick pics I sent the company, clearly the enhancements I made on Photoshop went unnoticed and they thought, this guy's worth investing in. So they sent me over that. I'm gonna be putting it on my roof and I'm 
super excited about it and it's the final touches to this vehicle in fact the bed platform's done which i'm also super excited about the only thing i haven't done yet is ventilation which is going to be a big thing for this vehicle now because i'm sleeping inside it in the winter if you're interested in the four liter um, the metal is on its way, not the floor pan, but the box rockers, which will be one of the first jobs we're gonna do. So this will be done really soon and it'll be living outside. Sorry, mate. Um, and the four litre is coming in here and you'll, you'll see that. In between my, my, my kind of camping adventure videos, it's gonna be me sort of, sort of banging away on the four litre. So yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. Uh, all the support and everything else that, you, that you've offered me. Um, yeah, you know, see you in another video. Take care.